Hey everyone, DM Xavier here. We've had some awesome turnout over the last couple of weeks while I've been producing these initial set of videos. I'd like to say thank you again to the Twitch community, to the Discord community, and to the Instagram community who have come out and shown their support by liking these videos, dropping comments, and of course sharing and subscribing. I promise every little bit helps and I'd love to make this a little bit more mainstream and and get my stories out there so everybody can enjoy them. If you're listening for the first time and you're enjoying the content on this channel, please click the like button below, subscribe, share the videos, and don't forget to click the bell icon to make sure that you get all of the up-to-date, up-to-the-minute, in fact, notifications as soon as I upload new content. Without further ado, let's begin. Episode 4, Part 1, The Sunken Ruins. The group awoke the next morning packed their belongings, and made for the main road that led south towards the central hub of the entire continent, the city of Middleton. As they began to venture south, they started to see travelers. The travelers came in ones and twos with the occasional group, most of which carried heraldry of one of the main guilds from Helmkar. The city of Middleton was simple. Four semi-rounded sets of wooden walls outlined four major roads that led in each of the cardinal directions. When the group entered the city, they were amazed. Vendors, performers, mercenary companies, and beggars alike littered the streets, all purchasing wares from the stalls that lined each major road. Heskin approached one of the local guardsmen and asked if he could direct them to a local inn for the evening so that they could stay for the night. He noted that the most famous inn within the city limits was the Green Lizard Gizzard, and it sat in the northwestern quadrant of the city. Heskin thanked the man, and they moved on. The group approached the simple two-story wooden structure that sat in the center of the street that it was located on. Some of its second-story windows were wide open with wet, soiled linens hanging halfway out, giving off the feeling that the structure had just drunkenly thrown up on itself. Above the door rested a makeshift sign painted with black letters that read, The Green Lizard Gizzard. Well, this is it, Heskin said, eyeing the place intently. We're just going to stay here for one night before heading to Bree, correct? Breesis asked, looking the group over. I need food! Gash shouted awkwardly. Fenton nodded, obviously uncomfortable being in the atmosphere of a city. The group pushed the door open and entered the inn. Inside was about as disheveled as one could expect considering the facade. A half dozen tables sat nearly full with all kinds of kinds. Elves, dwarves, humans, gnomes, and halflings alike sat and dined together. From the rear of the room, a shorter than average, light green scaled dragonborn man with jet black hair slick back into a ponytail, stood as tall as he possibly could over the other guests. Even at full height, the man hunched over with his elbows bent at an awkward angle, almost like a raptor. He shouted from the rear of the inn, Hello, friends! I'll be with you in just a moment. Please, have a seat anywhere there's room and I'll bring fresh water. The man's voice sounded almost feral in nature, as if he'd only learned the common tongue a week prior. The group found a small, oblong table that had seating for five. They made themselves comfortable, and within a minute or so, the man approached them, walking on the balls of his feet, giving him a literal prehistoric feel as he moved. Greetings, friends. I am Bilefor, owner of the Green Lizard Gizzard. Can I interest you in something more to eat or drink besides the water? Perhaps I can offer you a room, too. I think something small. Dinner, perhaps? And yes, we'll need a room for four, please, for the evening, Breesis responded. Excellent! I'll bring you my stew. And for the room for one night, it will be three gold for the lot, please. Breesis procured the coin, which she had been keeping in a small magical trinket that she'd obtained years before. A small pouch which held a special pocket dimension inside that held only coins. The coin purse of the pocket plane. Bilefor brought the group four bowls of his dinner stew. Upon inspection, it appeared to be nothing more than simple potatoes, carrots, 
onion, and a few uneven chunks of an unidentifiable meat. Gash devoured hers before anyone could tell her otherwise, licking the bowl clean before Fenton could even touch his spoon. Yum! This the good food! Good food, Dragon Man! She howled as she cleaned the remainder of the stew from her bowl with her index finger. So happy you enjoy it, my friend. And here, your room key. Second floor, room 2B. He laid the small copper key on the table before strutting away like an oversized featherless chicken. The group silently, though mutually, agreed to pass off the remainder of the stew bowls to Gash, who greedily devoured them. Fenton, Heskin, and Breesis ate the bread and honey that remained. Afterwards, they retired to their room where, compared to the inn's dining room, they made themselves legitimately comfortable and bed down for the evening. In the morning, they awoke at first light and prepared for another day's travel. After finishing breakfast, which consisted of oats, water, and leftover dinner stew which only Gash indulged in, the group turned in their key and left the inn, heading for the western road and beginning their walk to Bree. The bustling of the city quietly faded to nothing more than a quiet breeze and the soft humming of Breesis' tunes. Occasionally, the group passed a small contingent of stoic-looking men and women riding slender, pure white steeds, while bearing a sigil of an open-palmed golden gauntlet against a white background. Breesis spoke up after noticing them more than once. What's with the royal guards? I've seen them twice now. Kind of far from any major city, aren't they? Heskin replied, Those are the Golden Hand Paladins. Queen Marsum of Port Weirlin orders daily patrols between Middleton and the city. They're a very devout and strict order and obey the Queen's every command. Nothing to worry about, though. They're actually very good for protection. Rarely will you find thugs and brigands along this stretch of the main road. Breesis nodded. Okay, well, as long as they're not going to hassle us. I get nervous sometimes regarding... She paused momentarily before pointing to her horns. I wouldn't worry about that too much. The only place that I've heard about that being an issue is Port Emerson. The slave trade takes tieflings as prized possessions. If we can avoid that place altogether, though, it'd probably be for the best. Good to note. Breesis said with a nervous chuckle. The group continued on, and after another half-day's walk, approached the outskirts of the sleepy village of Bree. The village was home to miles and miles of gently rolling hills dotted with swaths of flat plains where small farmsteads and fields of crops rested. As the houses and stalls came closer and closer together, the group collectively considered themselves there. All right, first things first, Heskin said. I think we need to find out who's in charge here and figure out what's been happening with this fruit situation and where we might be able to find these goblins. Fenton replied, I agree. That'd be the best thing to do for the time being. Afterwards, if we get a lead, I'd say that we try to find somewhere to sleep for the evening. Best to be at this as fresh as we can. With that, the group began to ask around, reaching out to the obvious locals and not those who seemed like fellow travelers. It didn't take long before the group bumped into a gnomish woman, standing about 3 foot 8 inches tall, with a thin build and tan, sun-kissed skin, wearing full gray robes with light golden hair and brown eyes. The woman stood at the market stall carrying a basket loaded to the brim with fresh and dried herbs. Excuse me, ma'am? Fenton started. Do you know where we might be able to find someone who has information regarding the goblins who sell this midsummer fruit? The woman looked up with a huge smile on her face. Hello, strangers. Of course. I'd go speak with Mr. Vunor. He's the mayor here. She pointed at the largest house along the strip in town. That's the place where his family lives. Hopefully you're not looking to purchase the fruit, though. I've tried to get my hands on it for years now. But I'm always outbid, she said as a look of sadness crept over her face. You... you've wanted that fruit? Are you sick? Breesis awkwardly asked. No, 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 nothing like that. I'm the local healer. Herbalist, really, but I've tried to get my hands on one of those fruits to experiment with. She smiled sweetly. Oh, okay. Do you sell healing salves and potions, then? Breesis asked again. I do. My name's Corky Knackle, but you can call me Corky. Come stop by sometimes. 
If I'm not here purchasing ingredients, I'm usually over there. She pointed again, this time in the opposite direction, to a small hut with a straw roof, no more than 15 feet long and 10 feet wide. I'm Breesis. It's nice to meet you, Corky. We'll come and see you soon, and thank you for the information. With that, the group began walking towards the house of the mayor. The house was magnificent compared to all the other buildings in the village. Not exquisite by any means, but exotic in comparison to the straw and thatched roofs. This building was two stories high with a gray slate roof, a chimney, and actual glass windows decorated with linen drapery from the inside. The group approached the door and knocked. A full minute went by before an audible shuffling sound was heard from the other side. The door quickly unlocked and creaked open. Standing in front of them was an extremely elderly human man, bent almost completely in half, using a cane to keep himself from falling over. He carried a small, unlit lantern in the other hand and wore brown and black robes with nothing more than hard-soled slippers on his feet. The old man looked the group over, especially at Gash. Uh, what do you want? He snapped. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, we're here to see Mayor Vunor. We were told that we could find him here. We have some questions about this midsummer fruit, Breesis said. The old man didn't take his eyes off Gash for a second. We don't want your kind here. Plus, the mayor is busy, he said as he began to close the door. Disgusting half-bred mongrels. The door clicked closed and locked as quickly as it had unlocked. Breesis, Heskin, and Fenton stood in complete shock by what they had just heard. In unison, they looked up at Gash, who stood as stoic as ever, with a half-toothy grin on her face. What? Was it me? She said, ruffling her nose ever so slightly. Realizing she had no idea what had truly just happened, the three looked at each other before Heskin approached the door again. He knocked loudly this time before shouting, We need to see the mayor immediately! I will not accept no for an answer! He knocked again with an angry fist. Another full minute went by and the door opened again. This time, a middle-aged human man with short brown hair and a graying beard, dressed in very formal noble's garb made of multicolored fabrics, leather boots, and gold rings and buckles stood before them. Is there something that I can help you with? Were you the ones who just spoke to Laverne? He said, looking the group over. Yes, and quite frankly, he was horrifically offensive and rude to our friend here, Breesis replied as she gestured to Gash, who nodded and looked past herself into the open air next to her. I'm so sorry, the man whispered. I'm Mare Vunor. Laverne has been my family's butler since I was an infant. He comes from the days of regular orcish raids. Please, come in. The group entered the interior of the manor, which was decorated in lavish tapestries, depicting scenes of knights fighting different chromatic-colored dragons in a variety of scenic backgrounds. Please, sit. And again, I'm beyond sorry for Laverne. I promise he meant no true offense. He's ancient. No excuse for that, really, but honestly, he doesn't know any better, he pleaded. Fenton spoke up as he sat. It's fine. Perhaps, as a true apology, you can tell us what you know about the Midsummer Fruit? We've been tracking a group of cultists that led us to information about some sort of midwinter fruit, but the only piece of information that we have, or that makes any sense right now, is a Midsummer Fruit which supposedly grows near here. Vunor's body sank heavily against the back of his chair. His face went limp. Of course. A group of goblins that reside in the ravine just north of town, once home to a massive citadel from ancient times before sinking into the earth, have come to this town at least once a year to sell what they call a midsummer fruit. The fruit is said to contain magical properties that can heal any ailment. Strangely enough, the goblins never came this past season. Now that led me to gathering a group of, well, we'll call them liaisons on behalf of the town to seek the goblins out and find answers. The cut of the profit we received from the sale of the fruit was enough to keep us and them very happy. The group was sent out some four weeks ago and honestly has yet to return. His face, void of all emotion at this point, turned white. I fear them dead, honestly. My daughter Sharwin and son Talgan were two of the four that went. The others, Sir Bradford, a paladin of the Order of Paylor and Caracas, an elven ranger, were the other two. 
I honestly thought that Sir Bradford's magic sword would have been enough to at least keep them safe, but it's been far too long at this point. Can you tell us where they went? Our investigation is extremely important. We need to get to these goblins, Breesus asked. I don't want to see another group meet their fate this way. However, if I don't tell you, someone else will. If you decide to go, can you please just keep an eye out for my children? If they're alive, please bring them back to me. If not, just bring me their family signet ring so I can arrange a proper service in mourning period. I can also offer 125 gold for each signet ring or child that you bring back to me. Of course we can. Fenton said. Thank you, Vunor said with a slight smile. They went to the ravine itself. If you head north along the old road straight out of town, you'll find it. You literally can't miss it. With that, the group stood and bid Vunor a farewell. They exited the manor and walked the stretch of the road going west before they reached a run-down tavern called the Old Boar Inn. They entered and were immediately overwhelmed with the scent of stale piss water beer and mildew. Two other travelers sat at an old wooden table keeping to themselves. At the bar stood an older human man balding on top with unkempt gray hair around the edges. His belly was as big as a harvest festival pumpkin, and his clothes were soaked in sweat, or beer, or both. He smiled as the group entered. Come on in, have a seat, let's have a drink, he said, struggling to bend over for fresh mugs. The group approached the bar and sat. The man immediately smiled at Breesis, making an attempt to lure her into his gaze with raised eyebrows and sluggish winks. Oof, you're a gorgeous specimen, aren't you? He said to Breesis. Breesis looked around in partial horror. Excuse me? She said. You, sweetheart, you're gorgeous. What would I have to pay to get you to spend the night with me? He replied. And don't tell me nothing, baby, because everything has a price. Breesis' eyes went wide. I, I don't think I completely understand what's happening here, but I'm not interested. Thank you. Guys, can we maybe just camp under the stars tonight? Heskin was already off of his chair by the end of the sentence. It's time to go. Sir, you're disgusting. Thank you. The group collectively turned to walk out. As they reached the door, they heard clear as day. Demon-blooded bitch. Too bad it wasn't succubus, inna. Breesis' blood boiled, but she held on to her aggression so as to not commit murder in this sleepy backwater village. The group exited the tavern and consoled Breesis for a few minutes, explaining to her that the world was filled with horrible people, no matter where you went. Breesis finally calmed herself and suggested they go investigate the ravine before making a true trek into the darkness. Everyone agreed, and they began walking north along the main road. A few hours went by without issue before they reached what appeared to be a lush and fertile landscape, suddenly cut off from all nutrient sources. An 80 foot wide and multiple mile long gash in the earth, completely stripped of vegetation, sat like a barren wasteland. The group approached a series of stone pillars that jutted from the earth around the edge of the ravine. Two of the pillars contained a knotted length of rope tied off at the furthest pillar and loosely draped over the further of the two, descending into the darkness. Breesis looked at one of the pillars. Strange. These are dwarven alphabet characters here. However, it appears whoever arranged them did so like some sort of graffiti. I have no idea what they say. Meanwhile, Gash had begun testing the rope which seemed to be in good repair as she had begun to swing around the edge like an expert mountaineer. This good. Rope is solid. Let's go down. Hey, icy stairs. She shouted as she began to rapidly descend into the darkness. The rest of the group rushed to the edge in a panic, thinking that she had fallen. When they reached where she had gone over, they saw that she had already reached the crumbling platform some 60 feet below. Everything good. You come down now. Come on! She shouted from below, her voice echoing wildly off the walls of the ravine. Fenton chuckled as he gripped the rope, shaking his head. She's going to get herself killed, I swear. He barely had enough time to finish his sentence before a cry of pain rang out from below. Ah, shit! Shit! Rats! Big rats! Giant rats! 
The cry quickly turned into an angry, raged scream as Gash began wildly swinging at what appeared to be three dog-sized rats, all of whom were aggressively biting and clawing at her. Fenton descended quickly down the rope, followed by Heskin and finally Breesis. When Fenton reached the platform, he hopped down and swung hard down on one of the rats. In turn, the rat turned its attention to him and jumped, landing on his thigh and biting down hard. Its three-inch fangs sunk deep into his leg and immediately drew blood. Fenton cried out in pain and began furiously attempting to detach the parasite-like rat. Gash swung down again on the rat she'd missed twice so far and finally landed a blow, splitting the rat down the center, spilling its guts out onto the stone floor. Heskin landed with a soft thud, swinging his mace in the process. He hit the rat on Fenton's leg hard enough to force it off, but not hard enough to kill it. With that, he whispered a word of divine power that conjured a moat of golden energy, healing some of the wounds that Gash had suffered in the initial assault. As Breesis descended, she lost her grip suddenly and began to plummet. Although she managed to brace herself, she hit the ground hard with an audible crack. She yelped out in pain and turned over, revealing a wrist that was obviously broken. She backed herself against the wall of the ravine and whispered a single word of power herself. Much like Heskin's, though this moat hummed around her hand with a light purple glow before causing the wrist to crack again, setting itself and healing. She breathed a sigh of relief. Fenton muttered an incantation and his staff glistened like diamonds. He swung down with it and caught the rat in the side of the head, breaking its neck and sending it tumbling down the stairs. Gash threw down her axe, grabbed the final rat in front of her, and lifted it from the ground. It bit her hands and arms as it thrashed about. In an instant, she screamed and squeezed, causing the eyes of the rat to bulge from their sockets. A moment later, the beast ceased moving. Gash let the rat go and sat down, licking her wounds like an old hound. Heskin tended to her with his healing magic while Fenton conjured berries from his magical staff. As he ate them, the bite wounds on his legs sealed up. The group then stood and gathered themselves before heading down the set of switchback stairs that descended another 80 feet into the darkness. While they walked, they noticed signs of travel recent travel, within the last few weeks, by both humanoids and goblinoids. When they reached the bottom, Heskin lit his mace with a divine incantation, and they stood face to face with a massive, partially crumbled tower, the architecture from the age of the first happening, some 1,000 years ago. Taking a deep breath and preparing for the worst, they entered the 30-foot-long, 20-foot-wide courtyard in the tower. Around them stood partially collapsed ancient stone walls and a single intact stone door, which sat closed. Gash and Fenton made for the door, with Heskin and Breesis in tow. As Gash placed a hand on the door, the floor under her and Fenton suddenly shifted and collapsed under their combined weight. Gash lunged for the side and managed to tumble out of the pit. Fenton was not so lucky. He fell ten feet down into a darkened chamber. Around him lay two goblin corpses in the early and mid-stages of decay. Heskin looked over the side. Fenton? Are you alright? Fenton groaned. Ah, I'm alright, but wow, did that hurt. Looks like a couple of goblins already fell for this trap. Someone must have reset it. With that, a sharp pain rang out in Fenton's calf. As he looked down, he noticed another massive, dog-sized rat latched onto him, biting chunks of flesh from his legs. He began to shout, Oh! Shit! Oh shit! Help! Help me! Priestess was the first to react. She knocked an arrow on her short bow and fired, striking the rat in the rear left leg. The rat grew enraged and began viciously shredding Fenton's leg. Heskin shouted another word of power, causing a moat of energy to swirl around Fenton, closing some of the wounds he'd just suffered. Gash began frantically digging through her backpack before pulling out a length of hempen rope and tossing it over the edge. Fenton grabbed onto the rope while the rat continued its frenzied assault. Gash yanked hard, pulling him up quickly. As he approached the top, Breesis fired again, landing a second arrow in the creature's abdomen. It flopped around on the ground for no more than three seconds before falling still. Shit, Fenton panted. I can't do that again. I need to go back up. I think that we've seen enough for today. 
Heskin and Bresis began pouring what was left of their magic into healing for Fenton. Once he could walk again, the group agreed to head back to the stone platform above. Within minutes, Fenton began to sweat profusely. His skin took on a pale hue, and as they reached the final few steps, he turned and vomited over the edge, sending what was left of his breakfast into the darkness below. Heskin sat down and began to run a medical evaluation on him. Fenton, I think those rats had an infectious bite. Some sort of disease is rapidly taking over your body. I need to get you to the surface quickly. Gash lifted Fenton with one arm and began to pull the two out of the ravine with the other, followed by Heskin and Bresis. I do this. I take him to Little Healer Lady. You stay and watch Wound in Earth. Make sure no funny business with the gobbies. Gash called out below her. As the group reached the top, Fenton became cold to the touch. The disease was rapidly spreading through his body. Gash removed three of the rat corpses that she'd gathered from the platform below and began to quickly rip the skin from their bodies. While the rest of the group watched in awe, Gash quickly crafted a makeshift lean-to out of the rat skins and branches she'd found nearby. As she finished, she brushed her hands off and tossed the remainder of the corpses down into the ravine. There, I make you good home for tonight. We get the druid help from the little healer lady, and then come back in the morning if he okay. With that, Gash picked Fenton up and began to carry him back down the old road towards Bree. Heskin and Bresis eyed the still dripping lean-to that had just been made before Bresis finally spoke up. Yeah, I'm not sleeping under that thing. If you want to, that's fine, but Heskin interjected. No, not a chance. We can sleep under the stars. Bresis laughed. Good. I didn't want to offend her, but that thing's horrid. I hope she can get Fenton seen quickly. He got really sick really fast. Rat wounds can fester after a single bite. Some can even be deadly. Corky should know how to treat it. I could have done it myself if I had the kit, but unfortunately I don't, Heskin said. With that, Bresis and Heskin laid out their sleeping bags, ate some dried meat and fruit that they had taken from Helmcar, and laid down for the evening, switching lookout shifts as they awaited the morning. I'd like to give another huge shout out to everybody who's taken the time to watch these videos, to all of the subscribers, to those of you who are taking the time to share the content. It is very much appreciated. I've had some awesome feedback so far, and I really hope that you continue to provide me with feedback, both positive and negative. Give me everything you've got, because I want to make sure that these videos are being produced to your liking. I've already lived the stories. Now it's your turn. Please remember to like this video, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, share this video and all the others on the channel to help spread the word, and of course, comment below with your favorite moment of the episode. Please stay tuned for episode 4, part 2, The Sunken Ruins, as it will premiere later this week. Until next time, my friends, be well and roll 20s.